Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, my sisters and my brothers, and welcome to part two. Pray to Allah that you enjoyed part one and it gave you a little bit of uh, insight into my world. I will just jump to my uh, second part as I worked in Baker Street in Regent's Park Mosque uh, in London. When I came back from the United States in 2002, Yes, to, uh, towards the end of 2002. Uh, at that time, uh, the, the, the mosque, or Regent's Park uh, Mosque, wasn't a total mess. The, the director had a uh, secretary, and that secretary was uh, a man, I think from Sudan, and that man <laughs> wasn't, uh, wasn't taking care of the office as he ought to. As such a, uh, from outside, very respected, uh, institution, Islamic, because the British government looks at it as an authority. But when you go inside and you see how it's run, you scratch your head. How is that possible? A friend of mine, uh, who happens to be the driver of the director of uh, Central Mosque, uh, uh, Mohammed Dubayan, Ahmed Dubayan, yes, he's a politician. He works with the Saudi embassy, and the Saudi embassy uh, will just uh, appoint him to be the director, and that's how they keep in touch, and they keep their hands on the Islamic institution. Uh, this friend of mine uh, knows the director because he drives for him, and the, driver, uh, the director was complaining about something. And my friend who knows me told the director, aha, I know the person just right for you. His name is Abdul Salam. So my friend calls me and says, would you be interested in helping uh, the Islamic uh, center? They're having a big seminar and they really have nobody to help them. Would you please come and help them with the project? I said, yeah, sure, I would do that. So I went to the mosque and I met the director and he said, okay, the big seminar we have in is, there is this big institution in Morocco who wants to run a seminar in London. The seminar will talk about the migration of the uh, Muslim brains to the West. Why they don't stay in the Muslim world and why do they go to the West to work? And when they go there, they enrich the western parts of the world and they become more advanced in size and everything. And I said, uh, okay, I, I will help. So when I got to the office, it was a complete mess. Pot of tea here, the biscuits are there, little mouse running here, and it's, 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 the mess is incredible. So I said to the director, okay, if you want me to help, it's either you give me a new office or we clean this one. He goes, do what it takes. The seminar is in two weeks' time. Now you can imagine, we started cleaning, we started doing this and did that, and then I go to the computers, they don't have a proper computer, so I had to bring, and this is in 2003, yeah? So I started bringing my laptops with me, and connect. so all I want to do is help them succeed in, the, in this seminar that they, they had there, and then I designed the leaflets, got in contact, called people. I was project manager of that place, yeah, uh, of that particular seminar. And, uh, and then the seminar came and I sat down, of course, as an organizer, I had my suit, my badge, and everything was under my leadership, organizing everything, food, everything you can think, security and everything, the timetable of the speakers, I designed that well too, I introduced the speakers, and people thought I was an authority, hey, to me it doesn't matter. Um, I have a master's degree, so to me, it's okay that they think of me a big shot. But to the other sheikhs and to the other, uh, I don't like to call them scholars, but to the other uh, sheikhs and the doctors and PhD holders and the speakers and things like that, uh, they were referring to me very respectfully. And I, to me, yes, I'm helping, but I don't need to tell them, oh, I'm just helping. So to them, I, they thought I was working in there. And of course, the seminar went very well, and then as is the case for any project that you undertake, when you finish the project, you must do a report, and that's the closing part of the seminar, where you say the, the challenges, just in case someone else will take the project later on, at least they know what you've done. So you go, and I did the report, and I gave it to the director, about a week later on. The director was gobsmacked. He was absolutely... Uh, totally surprised and he told me it's the first time I see something like this and uh, and then he said would you work for us here 
And, uh, and to me at that time there, I had already had my share of hurt from the Islamic institution. And I said, doing what? He goes, well, initially, you start as uh, my assistant, and then uh, he goes, I'll move you up. I said, okay, I said, so we discussed that. He gives me, he gives me the job description, and my job is to actually assist him to become the PA to the director. And I said, okay, that's fine. I was reluctant in my yes, because I know how the Saudis operate. And I started working, of course, I had to redesign everything, the filing system, the database, the phone, the script, ah, Allah, I started from the ground up, because they had absolutely not a thing. The more I worked to make things better, the more impressed the director was. And slowly he started dumping on me uh, other departments. You do the department of the media, where newspaper, the television, international uh, satellite networks, uh, places from all over the world, when they, they want to do an article on Islam or something, they contact us because the masjid is an authority. Remember, the other people look at it like we look at the, the Vatican in Rome. We don't know what goes inside, but we look at it as the absolute authority for Catholicism. So the same thing here. All these international institutions in the West, they look at what goes on in Baker Street as the ultimate authority of the Muslim world. So there you go, I found myself as the media manager. And as a media manager, now I started attending functions, either Islamic or non-Islamic, interviews, uh, radio shows, and I contributed in many of the, the BBC to different articles for, with different people, and uh, uh, out-of-the-body experiences is one that comes to mind now, and a few others. And I found myself now back to square one as I would go to university, give talks. Now I'm doing it at a national scale. Well, I talk on television, sometimes I talk on uh, uh, newspapers, interviews, sometimes on, uh, anyhow, in all that kind of stuff. That's the media department, and I go, okay, every time something happens in the world and the media wants an opinion, they contact us in Regent's Park, and they always end up at, at the end, I end up at the end of the phone, it's a phone interview, or they come to the central mosque, and there are, I've got many of the VHS tapes because I always requested that they would send me a copy of the interview, and they would do that. Now I have loads of them uh, sitting there. And sometimes on YouTube, someone would send me me talking on uh, YouTube. It's funny to see yourself talk, but hey, that's that. Well, when the media went very well, now the director wants me to take the Dawa department and manage the Dawa department in cooperation with the Dawah Office of Saudi Arabia. Tell you how it happens. The Ministry of uh, Islamic Affairs in Saudi Arabia has uh, sponsored sheikhs here in the UK and wherever in Europe they are. These sheikhs are paid by the Saudi government to promote Aham, Aham, Salafism, when in fact they are just promoting Wahhabism, the Saudi version of Islam. These sheikhs, around a hundred of them, are um, paid on, on a monthly basis, yeah, they get their wages. Now, my job as the um, um, uh, Dawa department manager is to also help the Dawa the, uh, office of Saudi Arabia manage these sheikhs. And that's when I started dealing with them and sit with the sheikhs and uh, try to gauge their knowledge, ask questions, and then I would point them. And uh, of course, when you talk to these people and they speak to you about knowledge and things like that, if they feel you are less than them in that knowledge, of course, they, they disrespect. But alhamdulillah, every time they talk, they, <laughs> they, they, I was a par or sometimes even above. Some of them I think like, how is this person employed as a sheikh? How? But anyhow, because the Saudi government would see that this person, uh, I don't want to give races and uh, countries and things like that, but he can talk to his people, even though this person cannot be full-fledged sheikh, but he will fulfill a job at promoting the Saudi Islam to the, the communities here in the West. And then I started doing something new, uh, running project management for the sheikhs, where I would invite them to a central mosque, 
they would come there on a weekend, then we have a Saturday, Sunday, I design courses, I give talk, talks, I invite other people, and I give ideas, I give methodologies, I give things, I give, oh, it was, uh, of course, <laughs> the sheikhs didn't like it because they don't like to be told what they uh, to do. And I told them one day, look, if you don't listen from me, what I'm telling you that's going to make life easy, where we can uh, give Islam in the best forms of the people here, why would you expect people to listen to you? Because what I found out is a lot of these sheikhs were getting easy money, and their job is sometimes just to give one talk a week. So when I started working with them, statistics, do this, do this, do this, they didn't like, they felt like I was pressurizing them. And in fact, I was not. I was just doing the job properly. And then one day, uh, the director calls me. And he says, Ya Abdul Salam, we, we are in a dilemma. He used to call me Abu Hanifa. He goes, Ya Abdul Salam, we, I have a big problem. And I go, what? He goes, there is this doctor, so and so. She's, she was Egyptian. Oh, she still is Egyptian. And uh, she, he said, I asked of her to organize a seminar or a course for new Muslims. I said to him, but I am a da'wah department manager. Why didn't you go through me to her? And he told me this. He said, Ya Abdul Salam, she is Egyptian. And he goes, and you know how Egyptians are, have this uh, uh, infinite affinity for titles. So I am a doctor, him and the director, he can talk to her. But from me, she will not take easy. Who am I to tell her she is a, a PhD doctor? I said, I have master's degree and my science is better than hers because I know what, uh, what her credentials. He goes, I know, but he goes, she's Egyptian. And that, that to me was strange, but funny. But you know, you can see the mentality of the Arabs. They love titles. So because she failed to plan or to arrange for that course, he gave it to me. And he gave it to me and he goes, we want to do it in two weeks time. I said, two weeks time? How is that possible? The reason being is this. He had a fund for that course to be done. And if after two weeks it's not done, the money will go. Obviously, him being the director, when uh, the, the, the course takes place, it goes to his credit. Because they're going to say, oh, the London Central Mosque did this, 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 and the director is this, this, this. I'm not mentioned, but he gets the credit. To me, it doesn't matter because my credits are with Allah, not with humans. I said, okay, what's my budget? And I'm talking about 2003, 4. He goes, okay, how about uh, 1500? I said, 1500 is not enough. Give me, I don't know, 2000 or so. Okay. So we started haggling over price. I said to him, what's more important, Islam or price? And then he goes, okay. I'll, uh, so he gave me 2000 pounds. And I went and I organized a seminar that people, <laughs> years later after that, they still talk about. It's called the Islamic Fundamental Study Course, IFSC. That's how it's called, IFSC. Maybe you, you've attended, maybe you've heard of it. But in people came all over from even Glasgow and some part of Europe to attend it. And uh, we had some aroma uh, candles in it. The food was absolutely fantastic. A breakfast with croissants, cakes, the talks. And I had some big sheikh, uh, big shot uh, Salafi sheikhs. Remember, I'm the head of the Dawa department in Central Mosque and working with the Dawa department of Saudi Arabia. So my world is ready. So the sheikhs here, when I call, uh, like Haytham al-Haddad, Suhaib Hassan, uh, and a few, uh, few other Sheikh Abdul Salam Bushkhid, few uh, Sheikhs that were active here. We used to give seminars together, and even in answer uh, questions and answers panels, we sit at the same table. They would ask me, they would, and we would answer. So there was that communication uh, of the Sheikh. And Alhamdulillah, I, I don't want to praise myself. But my knowledge is, is good. It, it sits with the sheikhs. And if they had given me the certificate of Saudi Arabia, now I can say I am a fully-fledged sheikh. But anyhow, so that, that's that. And then I carried on working with the same spirit, giving talks, attending. Yeah, Allah, I can sit here and name the projects that I worked on. And uh, also I was the assistant uh, editor for an Islamic magazine called the Islamic Quarterly. And this Islamic Quarterly is a um, uh, quarterly every three months. And it, 
uh, scholars, PhD holders from around the world write in English, and sometimes even non-Muslims that criticize Islam. And so I was uh, working with uh, uh, an Egyptian PhD doctor who was uh, lazy 95% of the time and I was doing that job. And then he gets the 5% of the time to put his name. It didn't bother me because I was not looking for uh, recognition from humans. Remember, I always seek uh, what's in the hereafter. So I can do the 95% of job and you can get the 95% of credit and I get 5%. It doesn't bother me. So I, I, I would work and then I would design the layout of the magazine and everything and then take it and print it and then of course after that I supervise the printing and supervise the, the posting and uh, we square again, go back to square one again, get articles, read which uh, article from PhD doctors who would get that so I go yes this girl that, that, that. and you know the story how an editor works with the, those articles. That's my life in, uh, in, uh, in the field of Dawah in the field. My, as a Dawah, the head of the Dawah department at the Central Mosque and the assistant to the director and the media manager and the IT manager, as you can see, I had four or five departments that I was the head of. And the director told me one day, Ya Abdus Salam, if I had two or three like you, this place would be completely different. I said, yes, I agree. Uh, I even have helped some, uh, someone, an American man called Khaled. He likes to be called Sheikh Khaled, but uh, he's not a Sheikh. He doesn't have... Uh, but anyhow, he's not a qualified Sheikh. He's just an American who knows how to talk nice uh, to launch his uh, Islamic uh, excuse me, <coughs> uh, satellite. He wanted to do that, like the Islam Channel. Uh, I worked with the Islam Channel also. It's it's few of these uh, uh, things. So one day, part of my head of the Dawah department, I started working with uh, the Ministry of the Islamic Affairs in Saudi Arabia in sending their sheikhs here, namely as Sudais, uh, Abdul Muhsin Abdul Qasim, uh, Abdullah Matar, many of the Saudi sheikhs who would come to the UK, and, uh, and, and I'm talking here like a, the caliber of a Sudais, and who doesn't know a Sudais, yeah? the, the, the manager of the imams of the Al-Haram itself. And I know the, the director of uh, al Madina, and I will tell you the story of the Hajj that I performed uh, in the invitation of the son of the king. I uh, was uh, invited to, with my wife to go and perform Hajj by the son of the king of Saudi Arabia. But anyhow, so what my job was is that, for example, a Sudais will come to England. Before he comes to England, they tell us, oh, a Sheikh Sudais will be coming, for example, from the 1st of June till the 15th of June. My job, Abdul Salam, was to design a visit plan for the Sheikh, which place he should go to, which mosque he should go to, what uh, and usually is the khutbah, the talks, and I will then they say, oh, in this masjid he will talk about this, in that masjid, I design his speech plan, his motion plan, where he's going to sleep, the people who are going to drive, everything from the moment he gets into the UK to the time he leaves. And that was also a success because I was doing a good job. And now the Ministry of the Saudi Affairs started sending more sheikhs, more sheikhs, more sheikhs. And some of the sheikhs end up sleeping in my own home. Why? Because when we get into the chit chat and they become like friendly and they loosen up and you find like some funny jokes in them. When they are with me in my home and it's me with them, that's when they really, really, really act for themselves. And I ask them questions, very uh, questions which if I answered them elsewhere, they would completely deny or answer as they are expected to answer. But when they are with me in my home and having dinner with me and now we're having tea or things like that, when I ask them those very touchy questions, of course they are safe and secure, they speak their minds. And it's incredible the level of hypocrisy. Really incredible. Really incredible. The music becomes halal and that becomes halal and that be I'll tell them why then do you give fatwa? One of them said to me, Abdul Salam, if we give the fatwa as we believe in, he goes, they will destroy our lives. 
Uh, uh, from because every year the central mosque would give I think 100 or 200 uh, free Hajj tickets to people. People are important in the community, so to speak. So I, when I was there and being me and the post I was occupying, I had under my duty as I was going to Hajj to manage this 200 people group, and it's a headache dealing with Arabs, with Turks, with Pakistanis, with Bengalis, with, oh, God Almighty, it's a headache, a full-time headache. The, of course, we stayed in five stars hotels and food and the coaches, everything was up to notch. But the highlights of this visit that I'd like to share with you is when we were in Al Madina. We went to Al Medina, we spent there about a week in Al Medina, in the hotels, uh, everything was fantastic. One day, a friend of mine came to me and he goes, uh, Ya Abdus Salam, uh, be here at 10 p.m. and bring your wife with you. And I go, why? He goes, oh, well, they're going to open the doors for us, to, uh, for the masjid, and they're going to give us a, a visit to the people from the West. You see, daytime you go and it's hassle and tons of people. At night they can take about 50 people and you get the mosque to yourself of the Prophet. And it's, it's a better experience. I go, okay. So 10 p.m. I told my wife, get a couple sisters from Canada, from America, from here. And I think women were six or five. But anyhow, yeah. so we go inside and the first visit was all right. We, we saw there nothing much to write home. Yes, we were not many, but uh, no big deal. But what happened in that visit is what really affected later on. As the person was introducing the masjid and he was explaining to us what they did and what they didn't and the projects and things like that, and uh, he was only speaking Arabic. And uh, the speaker kept looking at me. He, he goes, do I know you? Uh, and I go, uh, maybe, maybe not, I don't know. He goes, where do you, I go, I work in London, I am, and I introduce myself. He goes, yes. He goes, I've seen you, I, I came to England, uh, and it, as it turned out, he came to England with somebody else, and I was taking care of the other somebody else, and I met this gentleman for like 10, 15 minutes, so the, I, I, the, the impact was not big enough for me to remember the person uh, that time there. He goes, oh, it's me, it's me. Oh, I said, ah. so, well, you know, so this, we got into the huggies and the kisses and how you doing over there. So it was a good experience, especially that he was giving us the tour in the masjid. And, uh, you know, I would kiss his hand for uh, any favors in that masjid. And then he finished the thinking. He goes, Abdul Salam, I want to do uh, something for you. He goes, because when I came to London, you take good care of us. We hear good things about you here. I want to go, thank you, you hear good things about me? I guess, oh yeah. There's, now in Saudi Arabia, when the sheikhs go to, uh, to uh, England, they always say, oh, ask for Abdus Salam Abu Hanifa. He is, and they know my titles in uh, Baker Street. It's, uh, it's funny. I said, okay, it's good to be famous. It's uh, good. He goes, uh, tomorrow, come. That's what he told me. Tomorrow, he said, come and bring about... 10 to 15 of the people you trust. He goes, I'm going to give you a special visit that fits your, uh, your, your status. Oh, I said, thank you very much. I said, okay. So we agreed tomorrow, 10 p.m. And so I told my wife, and it was uh, uh, top on your nose, hush, hush, uh, need to know basis. So, and then we had the names. So they were about... Uh, 15 ladies, 15 sisters, and uh, about three or four men, uh, because uh, the, the rest I just didn't, uh, didn't trust them. So we, we went, and uh, we went to the door, uh, and then they took us, the door straight inside the masjid. 
And what the man said, or this general manager of the Masjid, Ghazi Abdul Salam, will give you and your crew here, the member, the tour that we give to presidents and uh, dignitaries like uh, kings when they come to Al Madina, he's gonna take, give us the same tour as they. And my jaw dropped. What? He goes, yes. And then, subhanallah, to the general public, they would. Put, if you go now to the uh, to the internet and you type, for example, the tomb of the uh, or the grave of the messenger in Al Madina, they will show you a door like a golden door, and people killing themselves to pass and to say salam alaikum, even though the messenger is dead and he cannot hear. But we still go there and say salam alaikum. It's, it's incredible how uh, the hadithic Islam is. By now. And, but he said, that's for the general public. And I go, really? And uh, they took us through another door from the side door where you walk inside and then you walk further inside and that's where the prophet is buried. In other words, if you just want to Umrah or Hajj or you go to Medina to visit, you would think like you are close to the gates of the messenger when in fact you are almost 10 meters away from it. So what they did is they took us beyond the gate and we enter. It's, it's, it's a feeling, incredible feeling. And the, 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 the ladies with us started crying. I've never seen a bunch of ladies cry uh, maybe in such a strong all oh, the tears and the way they were crying so much so that uh, the, 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 the the general manager he was scared because I hope nobody faints or any health problems I said you know it's the emotion because I understand I understand so the, the, they cried their hearts out and then they took us to the rauda or to the small portion uh, and we pray. And I stood in my salat, of course, uh, facing the qibla, but my left leg was touching the wall of the house uh, of where the Prophet lived. I, if I could punch, if I became Superman and punch the wall and make a hole, I could see the graves inside. It's an incredible experience. That is something. Uh, some ladies stayed friends with my ex-wife now, and uh, they still uh, reminisce about that experience there. When I came back from the England, and alhamdulillah, the, everything was good for the Hajj, and we got the nice reviews, uh, I designed, I programmed a database with the names. Back then, I'm talking about 2004, so like everything was young at that time, technology and everything, so I designed a database for names and things like that. Upon seeing this, I got my first offer to work for a Saudi German company. This company is responsible to build hospitals. And my job, my job description, was to manage the IT department, i.e. the Germans that would build the walls. And when it comes to the IT, I was the project manager. I would design the, the networks, the computers, the everything. The, the money was absolutely mind-blowing how much you're going to get money. The only problem that I had is Al-Wakil, the sponsor. Meaning, when you go to Saudi Arabia, you deliver your passport to somebody, which here is the government, and then your passport stays with the government, and they decide when they can let you out, when they can let you in, and everything. In other words, you become a, a legal slave. I said, no. I said, do you do that with American and English people? And they said, no, but they are different. I said, why am I different? It's because my name is Abdul Salam. He goes, all people with Muslim background, they must uh, put the... I said, no, I'm not going to give you my passport. I said, if my passport stays with me, I can travel freely and I can do that. Yes, but if I'm going to deliver to you my passport, and not only that, the passport of your wife and all the dependents. I said, no, I don't want to do that. So the, the project fell, uh, no problem. Later on, I think six months later, I got my second offer job. And this job is to work with Al-Walid ibn, Al ibn Talal. Well, Al-Walid ibn Talal or Bandar ibn Sultan. Yeah, Bandar ibn Sultan, not Al-Walid. Bandar ibn Sultan. My job also is to take care of, uh, this is a prince, a high-ranked prince. 
and this guy, <laughs> but you know, this guy is known for drinking and all that stuff. My job is also to go there and manage his IT department, take control of all this. And as uh, the offer was at the, the embassy was, is that I go there and actually relaunch the whole thing, redesign the whole thing, and I had green card to do as I wanted in there. Same problem. Money was good. My passport in the hands of the prince. I said, in no way I'm going to do that. After negotiation, they, could, they didn't want to go back on their thing, and I didn't want to go back on my statement, and that project fell down again. No problem. Kept working, kept working, kept working. And on the third thing, and this is uh, well, one Hajj, uh, the next year's Hajj, not the one I want, the, the, I think 2004, 2005. My, the, the dates are a little bit blurry in that thing there. Uh, the, the Saudi embassy was overloaded by workers. It, it had just way too many demands to go to passport requests. So I was asked to go and help there. So I went there to help, and then, of course, I rearranged the management, the, the, the staff, the computers, the database, did this, did this, did this, so that the, the process of uh, handing visas and all that kind of stuff goes a little bit quicker. And the job was done nice. And that got me also, a, like, the, the, who's the ambassador? A Turkey, a Turkey, a Turkey. Uh, what is that? Faisal ibn Turkey, yes. Faisal ibn Turkey is, is an, at one point in his life, he was the head of the, like, MI5, uh, like the special uh, intelligence of the Saudi country, the government. So he is a highly, uh, Jamal Khashoggi, which was killed in Turkey by the Saudi uh, prince, crown prince, used to work with this man himself. He was too close to him. He was a journalist. Me, when I went to the embassy, I used to meet with this guy because I would go to his office for the network, and he used to call me the whiz kid, the whiz kid. And later on, I, our paths crossed each other a few times, worked with each, I worked for him, I can't say for, with each other, but be a prince. And in one of my, uh, I'll, I'll get back to this about my, uh, my project of an exhibition. But you know, so when I went to, Saudi, uh, to, to the embassy and helped there and everything was fine, they offered me another third job in Saudi Arabia. And this job is different to the other two, because the other ones were IT, but this one was to work in the office of the Ministry of the Religious Affairs of the Minister, the Minister, like the Minister of Religious Affairs, I am the first line of interaction with him. So he talks to me and then from me, I go, because I can automate functions and things like that. And I said to myself, me, who once was laughing at my dad who could not read the Quran and I didn't know that the Quran was for all people and I thought it was just for the Arabs and things. Well, in fact, it is just for the Arabs. But uh, back in Algeria, said me working as the head of uh, manage, uh, head manage, uh, project management for the affairs of the uh, Minister of Islamic Affairs. What's going on? Again, the same problem. My passport. I said, no, I am not going to give you my passport. Give, take, no. Okay, that's it. And, uh, and then I decided I don't want to work for Saudis. I had a few other offers, but I declined them all. Now, back to the exhibition uh, thing. And here started my divorce with the Islamic Cultural Center. One day I was approached by a group of uh, very nice Pakistani Muslims. Maybe if you've been to uh, Regent's Park, sometimes you see they do an exhibition. I think they call it the Islam exhibition or exhibition of Islam, something like that. And uh, with this group of people, one day we were going to design a calendar. And I was thinking of a theme, and I designed a calendar. I still have a copy of it. The Islamic contribution, what, uh, what the Muslim scientist, which, uh, in other words, the Persian scholars had invented that the West is using today, like the Qataract, the uh, Abyssinia, and all these people. So we designed a 12-month calendar, and I did the design and everything, and printed it, and we sent it to every embassy of the world in London, including different departments in, in London and England. So to just to hear a calendar from us, and this is what we did. That's it. Kind of like uh, the, we have contributed a little bit. 
And, and that calendar was a success. I still have a copy now, it's, it's beautiful. But anyhow, when they saw that that calendar was uh, working, the, the, the embassy, the, the, Faisal ibn Turkey, the, the, the guy who is the, the ambassador now, who used to be the head of the CIA of Saudi Arabia, so to speak, when he saw that, uh, and he was pleased with it. So an opportunity, that group of people that I worked with for the calendar, for the data, they had an idea in hand, what if, of course, uh, they wanted to have uh, some exhibition place in, in the masjid when people come to visit. I told them, why not take it a notch higher and see if we can turn one of the uh, halls in the Islamic Center. If you go to the Islamic Center, you go underneath. There are like three or four halls that people hire for weddings and things like that. What if we could turn one of the halls into a permanent exhibition and work with the British government, I was well connected back then, to make it as a tourist attraction, place to visit, like Madame Tussauds or Big Ben or Trafalgar Square or something like that. The idea was absolutely mind-blowing. It's nice. So I started designing a program and I did a presentation to present it to people to try to generate funds. It just happened that I think it's somewhere in October, the bunch of uh, different ambassadors and uh, from different Muslim countries allegedly no, would meet at Central Mosque for to decide on what happens, and each one of them would contribute five thousand uh, dollars pounds uh, as yearly contribution. Uh, needless to say, none of them contributes. It's just Saudi Arabia that uh, puts money in that. And because of that, uh, it, the Saudi government gets to use the Islamic Center to their desire, to their heart content. They, they, but anyhow. So when I designed that presentation, and I went to these uh, ambassadors and things like that, and they were all sitting there, and uh, with them was a Turkish professor, the CIA Saudi guy. And I gave a talk, and uh, the presentation was immaculate, it was beautiful. And, <laughs> and then I ended up my talk saying, some ambassadors, and it happened to be El Kuwait, who did the, the Kuwait ambassador, and he was there. And I said, uh, some ambassadors would give a million dollar, uh, pounds to a zoo, and it's true, so that they renovate the cages of uh, monkeys and gorillas when they can invest that money in creating this, this exhibition hall which has these absolutely mind-blowing ideas. And I will tell you a little bit about it. And I said, then we are asking for 50,000 pounds and we can't get it. I said, I said, the world is upside down. And the ambassador, the Turkey, uh, the ambassador of Saudi Arabia, the CIA big guy, looks at me, he goes, uh, how much is this project? I said, uh, 50,000 pounds. He looks at me. He goes, okay, I'll give you 50,000 pounds. I said to him, thank you, Sheikh. He goes, I'm not a sheikh. I said, uh, back then, I said, you're older than, I, I'm talking here to a prince. I said, you're older than me, so I said, that's our way of saying sheikh, as a respect. And he started laughing. From that moment there, he told the director that he liked me, and then he would like me more involved in uh, other projects. And that's how he got more involved. Of course, the idea about this exhibition, if they hadn't stolen the money because the ambassador gave the money to the director. That money never ever made it to, the, to our account for that thing there. And then problems ensued after that and I had uh, enough of them and I quit the job because I don't work with thieves and liars. That's how it is. But the idea of the exhibition, how I worked with some um, design engineers and things like that, which brings me to tell you about the project of, of Mecca, but uh, let me finish this one. What I had in mind is to create like when tourists come, they would, the, from the world they would come and then they would walk through a small, a uh, uh, like a, a tunnel, a tunnel that holds two people most, and there is some smoke, and then when they come, we try like to, in the ceiling, to have something like the cosmos, like the stars and all this uh, constellation, just to create the vibe. Uh, uh, and the idea was, is that one day there was nothingness, 
and then Allah created the earth. And then as they walk in, you plasma television with the earth, and then they walk, sound if oh God, all this until they get back to the grave. And then after that, the grave is the hereafter. The, the, I when we even did a, a mother 3D on a computer generated and how people do we had the uh, all what you see in British Museum when you go computers things like that we had this on paper and on 3D film back in 2003 and 4 it was ready for production Be, way before the Natural Science Museum and Brit way before those things they stole our money they stole our money one and before I left, uh, one of my last projects, which I started working on and then uh, stopped, I was approached by uh, a group of investors, of course through the Saudi embassy, to help design a mock-up uh, plan. Today, when you go, if you go now today and you type Mecca and you go to see the Kaaba thing, you will see those big giant organic hotels that surround the Kaaba. At one point, I was the one that was going to manage part of that project. How, why I didn't carry on? Simple. I had the plans and I went and met with a uh, uh, few companies to create a mock-up for that plan. Uh, monies were agreed on and everything. Basically, what we are going to do is just create a, you know, how uh, a mock up and then you start showing up uh, a, a small one. Uh, this is how it's going to be here, it's going to be there. And everything was working to uh, perfection. Like, okay, well, this is how you do it. Agreed on the prices with the companies, they get the, the, the paper, the plans, of course, the copyright, it's going to go through lawyers because we don't want them to show them to somebody else and the project gets stolen, so it's all that kind of stuff. And I went to the director and I said, okay, here it is, all we need now is to send payment, I think, three, four, five thousand, I don't remember anymore how much, but it was at that time that it was a good a lump of money. And he goes, good, 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 good. Okay, he goes, I'm just going to contact the investors. And I said, yes, please do it within the next 10 days. It is no problem. All right. So me, I'm going on about my life, running the other projects and working hard to, to, to push Islam forward. And uh, two weeks later, I get a phone call on email. But, uh, either a phone call than email or an email than a phone call telling me that the payment hasn't been received. I always said, I'm really sorry. I was promised that it would be sent. So I go and see the director. I said, payment. He goes, yes, yes, yes. I've given instruction to the uh, accountant. Okay, the accountant. Huh? A month, two months. And then I said to him, if you are serious, send the payment. Or if you are serious, don't send the payment, but tell me. I guess some complications. What kind of complications? But Saudis never change. It's just like the story of the frog and the scorpion. One day the frog and scorpions were friends, but the scorpion always, always, always stings the frog. And he kills frogs. So one day the scorpion needed to cross a small pond. The only way to do that is to have the help of a frog. So the frog tell him, no, I'm not. The scorpion goes to the frog, please help me cross. The frog says, no, no, no. But anyhow, long story short, the scorpion convinces the frog to take them. He goes, okay, get it. As they were crossing, as they were nearing the other bench, the other end of the pond, what did the scorpion do? And it stinks the, the frog. As the frog was struggling and dying, and the frog said to him, why, why did you do that? And the scorpion said, I'm really sorry. The nature of scorpions is to always think because it's something in me I can't and that's why it is known in the Arab world and in the Middle East world that if you want a project to never see the light let it run by a Saudi if you want a dog to bite you a hundred times do business with Saudis and if you want someone that wants you to serve them and they will never pay back deal with the Saudi and all these three are uh, truth. Uh, what the, I'm, uh, the, I do have tons and tons of stories, like uh, my talk at the University of Canterbury. 
uh, and the cathedral, and it was attended by priests and archbishops there, and there was an interesting question and answer session. My children were there, and women students. Uh, uh, highlights um, uh, Swansea University. I used to do that. Cardiff University also. Cardiff Masjid there I used to give a lot of talks. Uh, Oxford University and uh, the Center of Islamic Studies there. Cambridge University, I did a few talks there, had a few meetings there. Even, ah, uh, oh, the, the number. Now, why am I uh, anti-Salafi? How, how did I turn into this person that uh, today believes 100% that Salafism is the most crooked sect in Islam is what I will talk in the next installment, inshallah. This is part two and after part three. And I thought this would be like an hour. <laughs> but, uh, but anyhow, uh, to part three, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.